I'm going to be honest with you because uh, lying is bad when you're preaching. Um, <clears throat> I don't know about this. I don't know about all this. I just don't know. I do know this podium sucks, and I... <laughs> we just can't have nice things, can we, guys? Okay. All right. You wouldn't think something like that would bother me, and yet it does. It really, really does. I don't know. I just don't know. So if it's okay with you, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to steal a minute here, and... Um, and I'm going to ask, Lord, um, it, it really doesn't matter what we thought this moment was supposed to be about. It just needs to be yours. It needs to belong to you. And so I, um, I s- surrender to you. I, I surrender. I surrender this moment. I submit to you. And if you'd like to say more or less or something different than what was in my heart today or this week, then please, God, please do. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your presence here tonight in this place, this room which we have made our own because we are here and because you are here. And that's always going to be enough, Lord, for me. In Jesus' name, amen. It was about 28 years ago that I, well, I guess it would have been my first experience at like a Pentecostal church. Charismatic. Do you remember that? Anybody? Anybody? No, maybe it was tonight. Yeah. Was there your first experience at a? <laughs> Welcome to the party. Um, I was I was eighteen, and it was a gathering of teenagers, m- maybe like a hundred teenagers in the room. They had a you know they had a worship team. And they, did, they were just going for it. They were like lifting their hands. I'd never seen that. I grew up in a Presbyterian church. I'd never seen that. People, people only raise their hands to like ask a question. That's what you do when you, this is, this is for asking a question. Um, and it was, it was both new to me and not new to me, if I can say it that way. It was new to me. the fact that, I don't know, I'd, I'd not seen people my age, I'd not seen even people have this kind of zeal, open public zeal for God. And yet it wasn't new to me because it felt right. I mean, it felt like that this is how I feel. This is what I believe, some deep level about God, that He he wants this from us. He wants our hearts, our emotions, our our whole selves. And in that sense, it felt correct, you know, to see people abandoned, passionate, desperate. That part was not new to me. That part felt old. It felt right. And in that moment, I had two revelations, simultaneous revelations, two that have stuck with me in point of fact. One, the first, was that I wanted to be this close to Him for as long as I lived. That I was made for Him. Made to worship Him. And that really, I knew in that moment, as as much as you could know such a thing, I knew that nothing would ever satisfy me short of Him. And that all other pursuits really were worthless in the light of His great love, of this great God. And I wanted nothing if I could not have Him. I I just don't know how to say it. I was sure of that. And at the same time, I mean simultaneously, at the same time, I knew, as strongly as I could know such a thing at 18, 
I knew that I was supposed to go to, to be in full-time ministry. I knew, I, knew that, I knew that I couldn't do anything else with my life that would be anything short of total surrender. That I wouldn't be happy. That if I was not giving my every working and waking moment of my life to help do this, to help people be in relationship with Him, to lay down their lives in the worship of Jesus, that my heart would be divided. And so in that moment, I felt like a vocational call to ministry, one I have not deviated from since. And I remember even telling my best friend um, at the time, Mike, I left and I told him, I, I, I'm called to ministry. I, I, didn't, I had no idea what that meant, but I was like, I know I, know I have to do this totally with my life. I, I, I confirmed it, you know, speaking to another person. And for me, somehow I knew that those two things were related, you see. This, there was this relationship between my desire for intimacy with God, my sense that nothing ever in this world would satisfy me except Him. And maybe at some deeper existential level that nothing satisfies any of us save Him. There was a, an awareness, a wisdom, a depth, a fascination with this one perfect thing, this pearl of great price. And at the same time, this, this, this sense of destiny. I mean, I don't, I don't want to be melodramatic, but, but, but like purpose, significance. And that would have been a big deal for me because I was a, I was a bit of a screw-up at 18. It, I, was, I, wasn't so, I wasn't this promising young man, you know, uh, at all. Uh, there, there may even be a couple of people in the room that can confirm I was nobody's first choice for anything. Um, And yet I knew there was some sort of destiny. In that place of intimacy is also the place of calling and destiny. Soteriology and missiology are, well, they're, they're, they're friends. They're sides of a coin, I think. And so I didn't set out to change the world. I didn't, I didn't think of that or even to do ministry. I, I didn't set out to do ministry. I set out, I'm going to be honest, I set out to be as close to Jesus Christ and as like Him and as devoted to Him as I possibly could be. I wanted simply to be His disciple. And I still do. But He, he has made me a missionary. I think it's what He does. I think it's right there in the first call of Peter. Come and follow me. Drop your nets and I will make you fishermen. It's, it's an invitation to forsake, to deny. It's an invitation to relationship with the one who took his finger and carved the world. And it's an invitation to some sort of new sense of who you are, some destiny, some, something to do, to act upon the world so that the world knows that you were there. To somehow share or borrow the power of God Himself to recreate the world. It's all right there in that first invitation. It was there the first time you heard His voice call you. It was there for me when I was 18. So now I find myself trying to get closer to Him, groping, struggling. And all these years later, I find myself in the business of change. I find myself face to face with a dying world. I find myself entangled in ancient fights. My covenant relationship with this one has thrust me into this work. Everywhere I turn, there are things that drive me, that drive us from Him. There's all this disunion, unreconciliation. That's the work. In the end, that's the core work of the devil. The core work of the enemy is to take what is whole and to break it into pieces. And the basic core work of God in the world, the core work of the Spirit of God in the world is always to make things whole again. 
to take that which has been divided or fragmented and to put it back together again. And somehow when we hear His voice calling us, yes, to save us, yes, to forgive us, yes, to make us first whole, it is also to somehow enter into that work of making the rest of the world whole. It's that big, really, actually. It's that cosmic. And so I cannot help but feel his grief. You know, everywhere I turn, demons really haunt this world. Darkness is everywhere. I feel his sadness when I have the courage to look in his face. And there are things that, you know, keep me awake at night. And make me wake up to go to work, to be somehow a part of the change, to charge into the fray in his name. And so I am a witness, as are you, to human depravity. My own life is a case study in confronting it. And maybe you can relate to some of this, I don't know experience the struggle of confronting, trying to change this difficult, dark world. Sometimes I feel helpless, like there is nothing I can actually do. Uh, 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 I don't know, not, just not so many months ago when we were at the other hub, I was walking in, I parked my car. If you guys remember how that was on 2nd Avenue, I parked my car and I was walking across the street to go into the hub and some guy, he kind of honked at me and he yells out of his truck, some sort of yehu yells out of his truck because he looks at me, I have my nice little bag, you see my little leather bag, and he yells at me, nice purse. Human depravity. <laughs> I was so mad, but the problem was that guy just drove off. And, and I was like, you know, what do you, I, you know, it's that situation where you're like th trying to think of what you're supposed to say, but there's no time to say it. Nice truck. Ah. I reject your gender stereotypes. I, 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 don't, I don't know what to say. <laughs> Grow up. You know, I, there was nothing. So I just, just, I said nothing and I just stood there like, okay. And then I was just left there to pick up the pieces of my masculinity and... <laughs> contemplate my manhood and collect the pieces of my broken life on the road there. Sometimes I try to engage, but I just fail. Uh, the other day I was, driving, um, I was driving into Home Depot parking lot, and I kind of was turning, and this guy, he kind of cuts in front. There, there was actually an, an old man, like a very old man, kind of hunched over, and he was pushing a wheelchair with, with, with an equally old woman, and maybe it was his mom, maybe he was giving her care or something. He was pushing, he was really slow, and he was going across this little, this little kind of intersection to get into the, the, the opening to the Home Depot parking lot. And this, this dude just swerves around and cuts in front of them and, like, almost hits them. And so, you know, he, the guy in the wheelchair kind of stops. They were going slow. He kind of stops, and then eventually he goes around. This guy stops rolls down his window and starts yelling at them like they shouldn't have been crossing the road, like pedestrians didn't have the right of way, like his left turn somehow had the right, like we should not try to hit old people. I mean, even if they don't have the right of way, how about, how about, how about just don't be a horrible human being? How about that? So I was, and you're going to see a theme here, I was mad. And so I felt, I felt angry. And so I parked my car, and I was like, I'm going to talk to this dude. That's what's going to happen. What's going to happen is this guy's going to school. He's going to like humanities school. So he pulls in, he parks in his parking spot, I pull in, I park in my parking spot, I get out of my car and I walk over to his car and I'm just standing there waiting outside his window for him to get out of his car. And do you know this guy would not get out of his car? <laughs> <laughs> I, I probably stood there for 10 minutes. I got to go, but I, I need to talk to you. Sometimes I know what I ought to do, but I just don't. Apathy. 
you know? I think it was Luke and I, we were, we were at the movies the other day, we were at Studio Movie Grill, we went to the movies, and, and they don't always, it's not the greatest movie theater in the world, and so sometimes it doesn't work, and so we were, we were there waiting for like 45 minutes for the movie to start, so it's 45 minutes past when it's supposed to start, and we're just wondering what exactly is going on here. So you can buy food there, so we had already bought food, ate all the food, it was all gone, so there's no, there's no music, there's no, there's, the projector wasn't working, so there's no, there's no ads, there's nothing to watch. All I had to entertain me, to keep me occupied, was this guy and girl sitting right next to us who apparently were on a first date. I say apparently, I'm sure they were on a first date because I was listening to every single word they said. Now, when I say every single word they said, I should correct that, and I should say every single word he said. And I was dying inside. Some sort of traditional man inside me was like, was just crying out for the injustice of this dude who would not let this girl get a word in. He just, and he was just going on and on about the parties he's been to and, and all his friends and the drinking. And, and he didn't ask her a single question for 45 minutes. And I'm going to tell you right now, some, if there's a guy in here sitting right now and you're single and you're thinking, what? What's the problem? I don't understand. <laughs> say more. Say more about that. I'm going to help you. I'm going to help you because I'm here to help. So I'm going to help you. Um, even if you're a completely self-centered windbag, just ask questions <laughs> to mix it up, you know, to surprise <laughs> the person. <laughs> is Luke here? Luke, was I with you? Is that who I was with? Yeah, and wasn't I saying, this is going in a sermon. I mean, the whole time I was thinking... <laughs> This has to be told. This story has to be told. And I'm turning to him. So all I can, I just, I'm, so I'm coaching him. I'm like, you'd never do that, right? I mean, if you're on a date, you wouldn't do that. He's like, Dad, come on, seriously. And so we're, he understands, you know, like show honor, ask questions, listen, be, be interested in the other person. So the whole time I'm sitting here thinking, and Luke can attest, I was sort of, it was eating, it was eating me up. I wanted to talk to her. This time I wanted to talk to her. And I didn't know how to get her alone. I didn't know how to get him away. But what I wanted to say was, run. <laughs> run. You, you're better than this. You're better than this. But I didn't do anything. Sometimes I engage and it seems like I'm trying to help only to have the devil steal it back. And then we feel that, what would, what would we call that futility, a mission. I think it may have been, even been the same night we were walking in, we were walking in from the parking lot and we got out of the car, closed the door and I hear this like moaning sound, this terrible muffled moaning sound and I look over and the passenger car door is open to this car and, and there's a man sitting in the passenger seat and he has a woman, her head is crushed under her, his arms and he's, he's suffocating her, strangling her. And as soon as I see it, as soon as I see it, I yell at him, hey, get your hands. I start running over and, and this is what happened. As soon as I run over, it freaks him out. He lets her go. She looks over at me and do you know what, you know what she did? Slammed the door, put the car reverse, and peeled off. Saving him. Dooming herself to more of the same. And you can't help but think, you know, the devil is winning. Somewhere in the world tonight, a man and a woman will argue. And he'll go off to drink it off, and he'll come back, and he will beat her to death. Somewhere today, a young boy will be coerced into some back room somewhere and have his innocence forever stolen and his sexuality forever disfigured. Somewhere a father will slap and humiliate and dominate his son 
dooming not just one child, but his sons and his grandsons to continue this cycle of male insecurity and violence. Somewhere today, a mother's milk, which has run dry because she has not eaten in so long, will cause her to lay her baby's head down for the last time. believing she's failed in her most important purpose. Somewhere in the world, people will take up arms against their neighbors, stick needles between their toes, contemplate suicide, become estranged from their family, steal money from a charity, cheat on their taxes, cheat on their marriages, and the whole sordid saga cries out for change. It cries out for Jesus. It cries out for us. for the people of God to usher in the kingdom of God so that we can be the family of God. And so he sends his sons and daughters into that mess. He sends us. I think if there's a framework for this weekend, it's Luke 9. And when Jesus had called the 12 together, he gave them power and authority to drive out demons and cure diseases. And he sent them to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And he told them, take nothing for the journey, no staff, no staff, no bag, no bread, no money, no extra shirt. Whatever house you enter, stay there until you leave that town. And if people do not welcome you, leave that town and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. So they set out and went from village to village, proclaiming the good news and healing people everywhere. That's, that's us. This describes us. This is, this is who we are. This is what we do. It's as old as, as the 12. It's nothing, we're, not, we're not doing anything new. The underground's not doing anything new. It only feels new because we've drifted so far. So much there. I mean, the ecclesial minimum's there. When, 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 when Jesus had called, this, there, there's part of it, the calling. Jesus calls the 12 together. There's that community. You don't go alone. You go in teams. He calls the 12 together. There's something powerful in that. The, the voice of God calling us, but then not just calling us alone, calling us together in community. And he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and cure disease. That's mission. We're, we're confrontational. What, what are we trying to do? We're trying to say, that isn't right. Here we go. We go into that. And don't, don't kid yourself. We're talking about we're talking about a confrontation with principalities and powers. We're talking about the demonic, however that manifests itself. It can manifest itself in very secular ways and actually quite unspiritual ways in point of fact and also in ways that are completely supernatural. But don't kid yourself. All of these ancient evils which we're confronting, many of you in, in very direct ways, this is what we're doing. We're still doing this. We're still supposed to do this. This is still how we change the world. It's how he did it. It's how we are supposed to do it. There's something, there's something in this work that we, we are supposed to, I don't know, there's, there's also some kind of unspeakable conflagration here of, the, of power and authority belonging to Jesus and then somehow belonging to us. Somehow we're borrowing, we're, we're, we're drafting off of that power. We, we, we take a bit of it somehow. We, his power becomes our power. I mean, this is outrageous. It's beautiful. It's staggering. I mean, I don't think anybody really has a problem with the idea that Jesus is going to walk with authority and power. Maybe it's his perfection. Maybe it's his sort of ethical standard. Maybe it's his willingness to die. Maybe it's his extreme love. Maybe it's his peacemaking. Whatever it is, we say, okay, Jesus has the right. I mean, maybe it's because he created the universe. He has a right to sort, of, to sort of bend it to his will. But what about you? What about me? Do you know that he's offering you that? That it's actually part, supposed to be a part of your identity? His power, His authority, somehow shared with you, borrowed. As long as you go and do this thing, we call mission. If you will step into that fight, I don't know, think of it as some kind of superpowers that only activate if you step into the ring. You don't have super strength to just open cans or something like that. You, you have super strength when you get into the ring. What is that called? Prevenient grace. It's there only when it is needed, when it has to be called upon. And I'm sure, I'm, sure, I'm just sure, that the church in North America in particular is just sitting there completely impotent because we will not step into the ring. 
we, we have no idea what kind of strength we have because we don't put ourselves in a place where we need it. We're not standing in front of demons, so we don't know that we have the power over demons. Most people don't even realize that they have that kind of power. They're connected to that kind of power because they've never found themselves face to face with that kind of desperation and evil. But if you will, this is the upside and the downside of mission. If you will get there, you will see horrors and you will also see wonders. And so they do. Remember when they come back from this journey and they say, we can't believe it. Remember what they say? Even the demons submit to us in your name. They can't believe it. I'd like to hear that report more. I would. Demons and diseases are what plague the human race. Call it what you want, categorize it what you want. These, these, these rubrics still matter. They still count. Demons and disease. And somehow we are called to banish these plagues upon the human race. <laughs> I think it's pretty amazing, actually. And I think we do that, at least part of what we see here is through intercession, incarnation, proclamation. That will be the framework for the weekend. And we've asked people that are, that are pretty, pretty remarkable people to speak into that question of how do we change the world through intercession? How do we change the world through action, justice, through incarnating into a place? How do we change the world through proclamation? It is, I mean, in some ways it is the work of creation. God really never stopped doing that work and recreating the world, restoring it to the way it was supposed to be. I mean, the metaphor for change, the, the proper word, the new, proper New Testament word for change really is the word repentance. And that's what we do, that's what we offer, that's who we are. In some ways, the world is really ours to change. But you can't change the world. This is, this is maybe what I should say tonight. You can't change the world if you won't see it for what it really is. So I'm going to speak to your missionary heart because I know that's most of you in this room. That's who you are. That's why you're here. You're connected to the underground because it's one of the few places where you go where people understand you. And so I'm, I'm going to speak to you, you know, one missionary to another. You cannot change the world if you will not see it for what it really is. You cannot change the world if you not, will not enter into it. And you cannot change the world if you will not commit in love to hope for it and what it can become. First, you have to see it. Some of you know, some of you know Leanne. Some of you know the, you know, the ministry that she leads um, called Unashamed, the microchurch called Unashamed. What, what a remarkable group of people. And, and because they have a heart and because they feel kind of committed to loving um, and knowing and walking alongside the LGBT community, uh, they, they're sort of looking around at, at, at the places where there is like need and where no one is really loving on certain uh, parts of that population. So they realize there's all these, um, well, I should say too that Created, who works with women, vulnerable women, has for years and years gone and done street outreach. And so they'll go and do street outreach looking at women who are working the street at night and they'll, they, they often find these transgender women. And so they're not sure what to do because created as a ministry to women. And so here's a transgender woman. What do we do? And so actually Leanne saw that need and her team saw that need and said, you know, we want to go. We will go and we'll do that side of the outreach, the side of the outreach is working with transgender women. So they do. And they made a bunch of really cool, beautiful relationships. And they're just trying to say, look, there's a way out. And they're just trying to say, Jesus cares about you. And, you know, maybe, maybe the street's not the safest, best place for you. Just trying to build relationships with those people. So they go at night, you know, when these, these men, women are working. And so uh, she, told, she was telling me a story the other day of meeting this, this woman, this transgender woman. And uh, as they were talking, this, this kind of John who was there to pick her up um, is sort of circling, you know, like a shark, just circling. And she says... Uh, Oh, I hate that guy. He's so gross. He's so gross. Um, 
I just, I hate it. And so they're, 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 you know, they're trying to talk to her, maybe don't go. And then eventually the conversation has to end. And so as it ends, this guy's still waiting. He's still waiting. He's still waiting. And then sure enough, she goes and gets in the car. And he drives off with her. And Leanne, you know, really, I think, feeling a real sense of, like, existential crisis uh, when she told me the story, she was just like, Brian, what am I supposed to do with that? Like, it was really causing her anguish, you know, to watch it happen. Like, I don't want to go with this guy. I, I, I think he's disgusting. I feel diminished by this whole experience, this whole transaction. I'm going to do it anyway. Somehow I feel I have to. And to just bear witness to that tragedy. You cannot change the world if you will not open your eyes, if you cannot see how it must be changed. I mean, my only consolation to her was to say, well, that's why you're there, isn't it? That's why you're there. You cannot change the world if you cannot see it in all its terror and all its torture. If you cannot feel its despair, if you won't feel its despair. And you really can't, you can't change the world until you come to this truth too, that you are not able for her to come to the edge of herself, to actually say, what, what, what can I do? What, what, what power do I have to intercept this thing? What can I do? And to come to that other dual reality, that other, that other partner truth, which is to say, actually, in point of fact, you cannot do anything. You are not able, you see, to save. You must call upon someone else, someone greater than yourself. There is no way for the missionary except to reach up. And to cry out that these horrors are beyond our pay grade. Yes, yes, and, and, and if you hear one thing tonight, hear this. Futility precedes transformation. If you have not come to the end of yourself where you say, there's nothing I can do. I can't change this. This problem is too big for me. It's, it's beyond me. Now you're at the front of something. Now you know that you're actually doing something that matters. And if you've never felt that sense of futility, then I just say two things. One, stick with it. Give it a minute. Maybe it's too soon for you. Well, maybe you really haven't found a, a mission worthy of God, something big enough for God. Because it really is only in the place of desperation that we finally turn to God, abandon the flesh, and say, God, you must do something because I cannot. This, this, is, this is the you know, guts of missionary work. And honestly, if you're never feeling futility then you're not really taking a deep look at the world around you. And maybe you haven't taken on a problem big enough. But if you will, if you put yourself in a place where you will occasionally feel these waves of despair and futility, if you'll be there, some of you are there right now, and if you will put yourself in those places and then you will cry out to God, guess what will happen sometimes? You'll find that there He stands waiting to unleash sight for the blind, healing for the sick, freedom for the captive, good news for the poor. There he was all along, all along, on that street corner, in that car. Did I give you guys those pictures, Leanne? Did I give you those pictures? You have those? I'm going to show you something. So, you know who Pablo Picasso is? You ever heard of him? Spanish painter, kind of famous. No, maybe, yeah. Part of what's famous for is pioneering kind of a, what was at the time a new form of, of uh, art called cubism. Cubist artwork, what it does is it basically takes objects, he would, you know, they would analyze them, 
break them up and then reassemble them in some sort of abstracted form. So instead of depicting objects from a single viewpoint, we'll call that realism, instead of depicting objects from a single viewpoint, what the artist, what the abstraction wants to do is to, to, to depict the subject from multiple viewpoints, to actually look at it in a sense, to, to depict through a multitude of viewpoints to represent the subject in a greater context. It's actually an attempt to be more honest about the subject. Now, if you've looked at this kind of cubism, you might be like, I don't get it. I don't understand. And I'm okay with that. I'll show you one of my favorite Picassos is called uh, Girl with a Mandolin. Do we have that? Can we show that picture? Yeah. So that's one of my favorites. This, this would be an example maybe of cubism. And so while it seems random or even cartoonish, it's really an attempt to see something deeper, to see even more than what is there in two dimensions or three. Cubism is like painting for kids, you know, like I can't do it, so I'm going to, let's do something easier. Um, <laughs> no, I'm the only one that thinks that. Maybe they're just not very good at painting. And this is sort of like paint by numbers, just put blocks together, and it's like, look, a person. Uh, but let me show you the second slide. This is an early portrait of, of Picasso's first wife, Olga which he paints before he got into cubism, it's actually, it's actually quite striking if you, if, you, if you care about art and so on. If, it's not, maybe not the greatest light here, but it's an extraordinary piece of realism, actually. You know, the balance of it, the, the black and the red, and even her face, the pensiveness, it's, uh, it's really quite beautiful. And so, you know, this striking realism illustrates something important for us. I bring it up for a reason. You know, you can not really talk to people about abstractions like heaven or destiny or some version of them as a redeemed person, forgiven, healed, whole, until you can see who they really are. The truth is, this is Picasso could paint realism. And because he could see a thing in that sense, he thought that's not enough, there's more here. And cubism is an attempt to see more. And I think that's, there's some sort of metaphor there for us. We, we, we really can't uh, uh, offer people a, an alternative vision of themselves or an alternative vision of their families or their workplace or their or the place, their context in which they live. They, we can't really offer them an alternative vision of, of, of the future of the world. We can't offer them any of that if we can't see the reality of it first. I mean, really know the reality of it so that we can show them something else afterwards. And so cubism requires an even deeper sight to see a thing from many angles and then try to depict it for what you think it really is. Style aside, whether you like it or not, the abstract artist is right. We are more than what we appear to be. We are. And the world is and can be more than what we see on its surface. Picasso could paint realism which is why he could paint more. He could see more. You can't really change the world until you see it, until you understand both its beauty and its flaws, its complexity. See it from more than one perspective. The almost limitless depravity of mankind and yet the indelible image of God impressed upon every human soul. The there. We have to see it all, I think, and cry and throw up our hands and say, how, oh God, how do I do this? How do I do this? 
we have to see and say that, with that, 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 that tragic, beautiful first line of lamentations, lonely lies the city. To look upon our city, our neighborhood, our place, our context and say, look, look, at how, look at how desperate it is. Look at how empty it is. Look at how deserted it is. Look at how lonely it is. That's where we begin with that honest appraisal of this place which must be changed. This place which grieves the heart of God. This place which, which, which manufactures brokenness. And to see it, to have the courage to see it. I mean, really open your eyes, really look at it and feel the wave of despair and pain. Own it, see it, so that we can paint something else. Jesus could paint realism better than anyone. He really could. And if anyone would listen to him, he would also paint another picture, which still today captures the imagination. That's the first thing. The second thing is you cannot change the world if you will not enter into it. I have a friend, uh, his name's Larry, and um, he shared a story recently. I was with him. He lives in Long Beach. Remarkable guy. He shared this story. He's, he's, he's a sort of an elegant, um, well-spoken, older man, pastor of a church. Uh, silver hair, you know. And um, he told the story of, of feeling like, well, there was, there was this corner right near where his church is. It's sort of like a war-torn corner. There was all these murders that had happened there, so many violent crimes. It was just a hot spot for crime right there in that neighborhood. And it was, it was a scary place, so people would try to avoid it. Uh, there's, there was gang activity, and there actually had been several murders that happened right there on that corner within the matter of a few months. And so, so Larry, in the place of prayer, felt like God was saying to him, I, I want you to go. <laughs> so I, I just, there's so much about this story which I just find... Um, admirable, crazy, whatever, is first of all, he's praying for the corner. That's the start there. Most of us don't even do that. See it, know it, like own it, pray for it. So he does. He's praying for that corner. And he feels like the Lord tells him, I want you to make a sign. Stay with me. I want you to make a sign. I've already lost you. Some of you are like, nope, not doing that. <laughs> make a sign. Okay, God's telling you, make a sign. And the sign, he, I, think, I think his sign said something like just praying for the end to the violence, something like that. So he made a big sign, like a picket sign. And the Lord told him, I just want you to walk that corner for a day, all day, just with your sign, and just pray. Can you imagine? And he was like, God, please don't ask me to do this. This is embarrassing. I live here. <laughs> but he felt the Lord tell him to do it, so he did it. And um, he goes to the corner, and he just spends the whole day walking up and down this little stretch of, of his street. Uh, with this sign, and he got harassed all day. Gang members came up to him, got out of cars, put guns in his face, and said, you want to see violence? I'll show you violence. He said he felt like an idiot, felt like a complete fool, but he did it. He was just trying to be obedient, and he just kept praying, and then he, and he eventually he stopped. He went home, and nothing. It was just nothing extraordinary happened. He just did it. He tried to be obedient. I mean, he was just praying for an end to the violence. He was an intercessor. He was like Erica. He was just standing in the middle and saying, God, please help because I don't know how. Because I can't. You must. Physically standing in the gap, protesting violence, hell, fear, death, all of it, just standing there and saying, I'm against this. I stand in the middle. Whatever that means, here I am. Proclaiming the ethics of another world, a better kingdom. This is true intercession, you see. To stand there in the middle. Our lives are prayers. Our words are prayers. Our actions are prayers. We are prayers. We are our prayers. Don't separate that. Don't tell me that prayer only happens in a room or in a closet or with closed eyes. No, we are our prayers. And there he stood. He tells me, he told me, he said, I felt nothing. I felt no change, no, no sense of significance. If anything, I felt stupid. 
and small. But he said, Brian, in the nine years since I left that corner, there has not been one crime that has happened on that street corner. Not one crime of any kind. I think that was a confrontation of the demonic. In himself, in his fear, in his vanity. Why would God make him? Why did God make him have a sign? Seriously, Lord, why? Why do that? Can't he just walk around on the street? I don't understand. The prayers still work, right? They're still going. What's the sign for? What's the purpose of the sign? Can someone help me out? What's the purpose of the sign? The purpose of the sign is vanity. The purpose of the sign is so that you don't feel cool. You can't hide it. This is what I'm here for. This is what I'm doing. I'm religious. You got it. Enter into it. If you want to change the world, you have to enter into it. And by the way, don't don't try to change the world, actually. It's too big. It's too abstract. Try to change one thing. Take on one street corner, one heart, one family, one evil. And in so doing, we see the thing, in fact, can be different, and suddenly the world is in our grasp. Listen, this is what I want to call the cascade of hope. If you can see one thing happen, then suddenly more becomes possible. If, if, if we can see one heart changed, one life changed, if that is possible, then suddenly an entire family, it's possible. For them to be changed. And then if one family, then maybe a street. And if one street, then maybe a neighborhood. And if a neighborhood, then maybe a city. And if a city, then maybe a nation. If a nation, then maybe the world. All of a sudden, those things are cascading towards something which actually we're supposed to believe is possible. But we actually can't believe that that is possible if we cannot see change within one human heart. One life to another life. Don't try to go change the world. Do the thing that is right in front of you. And we really can't change any of it if we will not start with one life, one heart, one place. And if we're not willing to put our lives in the fray. Being willing to step into that place of prayer for the healing of those who suffer. Being willing to confront the demonic for the destruction of the systems that hold us in suffering. Both sin itself and sin's confederates. Being willing to proclaim the good news of the kingdom, the hope, the dream of something better, of a world where God is king, where Jesus who dies for the world, where Jesus who loved the world enough to die for it, is the one who gets to rule. That's the only right way. I love Revelation 4 in this incredibly beautiful cosmic strange scene. Where you have it, it's, it's reminiscent of Daniel, you know, where, 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 where the Ancient of Days sits upon his throne and that's all normal. And the, the host of heaven, the sort of strange, uh, uh, you know, group of angels and, 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 and creatures all crying out to the beauty of God and the holiness of God. And there they are, sort of everything is right in its right place. And all of a sudden that one, which is the Ancient of Days, is gone. It disappears and the throne is empty and something appears in its place. Because the question, you see, the question that's haunting uh, heaven in Revelation 4 is who is worthy to break the seals? Who is worthy to open the scroll? And that's a question of judgment, you see. The scroll is the reading out of the edict of God upon the world. It's the final word of God saying, okay, here's it. This, this must end. This can be redeemed. This is the final word from God and it has these seven seals. And the question is, who is worthy to open it? Who can read it? And nobody's there. All the, all the creatures and all the angels are like, not me. I'm not opening that freaking thing. In fact, don't, so I don't know, not me. Who is worthy? This is the question. Who is worthy to judge the world? Who is worthy to judge you? Uh, spoiler, hint, it isn't some other person in this room. We need to chill on the judgment we feel towards other people's sins. There is one who is worthy. And this is what they see. All of a sudden that throne is populated by this lamb looking as if it had been slain. This sacrifice with blood marks. And they say, they sing, they say, the lamb is worthy. 
because he's a ransom men for God. Can't you see? The one who is worthy to judge the world is the one who died for the world. The only one who is worthy to judge the world, to actually say, you're wrong, this is wrong, this must stop. This will be punished if it continues. There is one who can say that, and that is the one who also died for those people who are guilty, who loved them so much that he gave his own life. That is the one who one day has the right to rip those seals apart and read upon the earth wrath because he has first loved this world. And I don't know, I think we cannot change the world if we're not really, will, will, really willing to love it. And part of what loving it means is having some sort of hope for it. If we would change the world, we must first love it and lay down our lives for that love. As a tribute to the one who loved them first. And I think part of what that means, guys, I always have thought... That love means pain. To love is to suffer. What did Shakespeare say? Romeo suffered love for Juliet. We love, it means we cry for that thing, that, pe that people, that place. This is also what it means to be a missionary. This is what it means. Part of how we change the world is that there is a group of people and a place in this world for whom you travail, for whom you cry, for whom you strive, for whom you grieve. We can talk about calling, and we should, and you need to feel a sense of calling and purpose, but I'm telling you, part of how you know what your calling is is that place where you weep. And if you say, Brian, I don't cry, I'm not a crier then draw closer to the heart of God because He is. I'm not saying to be sniveling or whatever. It just it, it maybe one tear occasionally, something <laughs> teary-eyed, choked up. <laughs> Work with me, something, some, some sign that you are a living being with a pulse, something like that. Years ago, I, um, I don't know, maybe, maybe my most listened to talk I ever gave, I told a story. This was so long ago. I told a story of um, losing one of my children in a car wash, at a car wash, not in the car wash, but at a car wash. <laughs> Oh my God, where is she at? I, Dad, she's in the car wash. No. It was one of those spray car washes right near our house. Many of you have heard this story. Um, I got out, I was trying to be fast, you know, because you only got like three minutes and you got to do the whole car, as fast as you can, switch the knobs, you know, I didn't care. Get out of here, kids, get moving. So I wanted them all out of my way so I could do it efficiently and fast and and uh, I did it, and I was like, okay, good, we're done. Now get in the car, let's get out of here. And so every, the kids get in the car, we take off, and then I don't know how far down the road I realized there's a kid missing. You know, there's two, but not the third. Start out with three, end up with just two. And so I was, you know, uh, part of how I tell the story is I just, I, I was yelling, I was mad at them, where's your sister? <laughs> it's as old as Adam, you know, blame. <laughs> blame game. How could you? You're responsible for your sister. Where is she? Rip back in the parking lot. We're looking. We can't find her. She's not there. You know, it's like 101, kids. Stay where you, you know, we left you. But no, she took off. She, she went walking. And I tell that story. I told that story. And I usually, I, 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 I would end by just saying, you know, there I saw her kind of across the parking lot. And I, I ran over to her. And this was Eve. This is my daughter Eve. And um, I don't know, maybe she was six, five, six years old. And I remember just grabbing her up. She was scared and alone, isolated. Maybe she felt abandoned. I don't know. And so I just took her up and 
grabbed her up in my arms and just said, honey, I'm so sorry. And um, I'll always come back for you. You don't have to be afraid. I'll always come back for you. And all those years ago when I felt that clear call to ministry, when I felt that clear call to be close to Jesus and then do whatever he was doing in the world to enter into that, I never dreamed that that sense of mission, that, that, that stepping into the fray, to the darkness, to confronting the demonic and the evils would ever have anything to do with my own daughter. But that commitment that I made to her that day in that parking lot has been one of the hardest things to do, actually. And I've had to over and over and over again, for her in particular, keep coming back for her. And she was lost that day in part because we just got separated, but she has been lost in a much more profound way. And if you see Eve, she's, if you meet her and you know her, and some of you do, she's just, I mean, in one sense, she she's, shines. She's unique and extraordinary. But that little body I collected that day in my arms is now covered with scars from head to toe. Star scars that she has given herself pain she can't seem to avoid scars not just on her skin but actually in her body inside of herself the pain that she can't seem to escape and she struggles and i asked her i asked her tonight if if i could share some of this and she said in in a moment a good moment i think of lucidity and honesty she said dad always you could always use my story Watching her struggle with drugs, watching her life be ripped apart by cruel and difficult people, watching her hurt others and others hurt her and feeling helpless and going right into that place of mission, that fray of mission that I realized I never dreamed would be my daughter. And so it is that the work of the missionary is big, it's cosmic, it's large, but it's also very, very small. It's that person who stands in front of you. That person you're sure is beloved by God. The person you're willing, actually, if you could, like Paul would say to his own people, what is it, Romans 7, when he said, if I could give up my own soul for them, I would. Mm, there's, a, there's a missionary principle you don't hear taught very often, you know, trading your salvation for someone else. I'm not sure God would make that deal, but there's a certain, there's a certain commitment to that, isn't there? I can't even remember ever hearing anyone say that. And yet that's the kind of commitment, I think, that, that beats in the heart of God, that says, I'll give even my own life if it meant that they could know Him. And I feel that for my daughter, and it's awakened for me uh, this, this, I don't know, very old, very primal thing inside of me which says, yes, of course, God, I would trade my life for hers. And I feel as weak as I've ever felt in my life because of this, this one person who means so very much to me, and yet I feel is so just, just one, just beyond our reach, just beyond his reach, it seems. And I lost her that day in the parking lot of that car wash, and I lost her again all those years later. And I still want to collect her in my arms and say, I'll always come for you. That's the heart of God, you see. If you, being evil, can give good gifts to your children, how much more? Will your Father in heaven not give the Holy Spirit to them who ask? We, 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 we need to feel that kind of connection and kind of commitment to the brokenness of the world around us. That's what should motivate us. That's what should move us. And I'm telling you, that kind of love is what actually begins to break down the world. It's what makes it shudder. It's what makes it begin to bend, you see. 
under the weight of these great things like grace. And in all of her rebellion and in all of her struggle, she still cannot really actually stand up to that. She still bends in front of it. She knows she's loved. Who do you love that way? Who will you love that way, that much? I want to ask you tonight, maybe I'm going to invite up the worship team. I want to ask you tonight if you'd be willing to burn again. I have this, this image in my heart of, of fire. And it's a lovely metaphor, isn't it, for the church to be burning. The problem is burning hurts like a mother. It's like, to, if you, I mean, a small burn, and you're like, wow, the whole world is right here. The whole, all of my sensations. You know what I'm saying? Have you ever had a small burn? Small burn. Your whole day is ruined. Your whole day is ruined. Small burn. You had a big burn? I mean, it's like, this is, this is traumatic. So what a metaphor. How about Romans 12? You know what I mean? <laughs> Living sacrifices on the altar, burning for God. Consume us, God. What a beautiful, what a beautiful consuming fire. Come and burn my skin? Ow. So here's the thing. Fire is the right metaphor because it does burn away the impurities. It does leave nothing left but something pure, something solid. Burning is what we need. Burning is what the church needs. It's what our hearts need again. And some of us, we have that fire that is burning inside us, that, that, that passion, that zeal, you see, that connection to the Father's heart for some place, some people. And I just want to say tonight, if that's true, if that's you, I want, I want to say, come on, come on, bring that fire in. Bring that fire in. I want, I want fellowship with you and with that fire. But some of you, some of you, it's just smoldering. There's not much left but a coal. The remnants of a fire that once burned for another place. And you're feeling, honestly, you're feeling like giving up. You're wondering if there's any heat there at all, if there's, any, if there's much left. And I'm telling you, do not give up. Not just for them, for that people who still, God still wants you to intersect their lives. God still wants you to be somehow a part of his redemption, his solution for those people in that place. But for yourself, for your own soul, to burn again, to dream again, as Melissa said. For some of you, that dream has died, that fire has burned down, and I, 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 I want something to happen tonight in your life. I'm praying that something happens tonight in your life, that there is an awakening again, a rekindling of that flame inside of you. And I'm asking you, I'm telling you, listen, I, 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 let, me, let me be a shepherd for a second to, 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 to my missionary family, to, to, to other missionaries. Let one missionary shepherd another and say, I'm telling you, the only way that you're going to rekindle that flame is if you burn your plan B. There cannot be another way. There cannot be a way out. I want You have to say again to God, nothing but this, nothing but you, until my dying breath. In 210 BC, a Chinese commander named Yang Yu led his troops across the Yangtze's River to attack the army of the Qin Dynasty. Passing on the banks of the river, passing through the banks of the river in the night, the, the troops awakened in the morning to find, to their horror, their ships were burning. So they hurried to their feet and they tried to fight off the attackers who were there burning their ships. But they only discovered that it was Zhang Yu himself who had set their ships on fire. And with their ships gone, the soldiers had no route of retreat. Tonight, will you cut off your route of retreat? Will you burn your ships? your backup plan, if this whole church thing doesn't work, if this whole missionary thing doesn't work, if this whole commitment to Jesus thing doesn't work, can you, can you, can you throw away your plan B? Because it's, it's just idolatry anyway.
He left them with only one option, forward or die. They won nine subsequent battles in a row before defeating this extraordinary Qin dynasty. I'm not sure we're going to be part of changing the world if we leave ourselves a route of retreat. If we're in it for the money or the ego stroke or to feel significant or important or powerful, I'm already telling you, that's a dead end, y'all. I mean, if you want to be a celebrity, super pastor person, there is a route for that. It is not in this room, and it is not with these people. There is no road here that leads there. <laughs> there is only heartache <laughs> and glory. The book of life. One day it will be opened. I like the turn of phrase that John uses in the, Revel the book of Revelation where he says, and their names could not be found there. And it implies that there will be some search made, you see, for your name in the book of life. And it's not really clear that this will be some sort of list, some sort of ledger. Maybe it's a story, the book of life. Maybe it's human history itself. Maybe it's the story of God at work in human history, changing it, making it his own, setting up his reign, setting us up in his reign. And the question will be whether or not you enter into eternity in glory or whether you enter into eternity in shame. The question is, does your name appear in the story? And a search will be made. What page are you on? Well, let's see, I was in the, I was in the 2000s. You're going to want to go there, check that. 2000 what? Nope, still not seeing it. Where were you? What were you doing? Well, I went, to, I went to first church of whatever. Okay, that's not in the story. That's not, I don't get it. What, what were you doing? What evil were you fighting? Where, 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 is the, where is the story of your great battle with evil in this story? Where is it? I know where mine will be. I know where mine will be. I know, I know the stories where I have left my blood on the battlefield where I have walked away wounded and defeated and occasionally victorious? I know. Do you? And will your story continue? And one day when they look for you, will you be on multiple pages, you see? Oh, there you are again. Well, look at you. There you are again. Well, well, well. <laughs> or maybe it'll just be a footnote, which is, I guess, enough to get in. So take it if you can get it. And so-and-so was a part of a group that went and did such and such. There you were, just sort of a list of people. He helped out, you know. Thumb up emoji next to your name. It's not glory we seek, don't get me wrong, but there, there is this promise of glory. C.S. Lewis says it's this weight thing, this, this God is preparing you, actually, for glory. And I want pages. I want pages. I, I don't want them to be struggling to find me in the book of life. Or you, or us. And what we do in this life, what we do in this life, this short breath of a life, this, 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 this internship, for eternity, what we do in this life is nothing. It's just a moment, a blip, a breath, a mist. Eternity is forever. This is, this is, this is a trade we should make every day. When I consider, Paul said, that our present sufferings, they're not worth comparing to the glory which we will, be, will be revealed in Christ Jesus. Will you bow your heads? Will you let God come to you right now in this moment? These guys are going to sing one more song. And I want you to enter in. I want you to say yes again to God in your own life. I want you to ask God, 
Whatever bit of that fire, maybe, maybe that fire has really gone out completely in you. Maybe that dream has completely died. Maybe some things have happened. You, you come here as a last-ditch effort, actually, to save your own life, your own soul. Guys, that's a little dark. Maybe just a slight bit more light would be okay. I'm kind of scared right now. Okay, that's good. Whatever, whatever, whatever condition your heart is in right now, I want you to offer that to God and say, God, please burn in me again. Please light this fire in me again. Please, please reconnect me with your heart for the people you call me to. Listen, guys, your calling is not over. He's not released. He's not done with you yet. He is not done with you. I know some of you are at the end of your rope. You are. I know that. He is not done with you. Your calling is not over. There is a second wave, a second life that he wants to bring back into you. Find that right now. Guys, just one more song. There's nowhere you need to be. Let this be a moment of real connection, of transformation for you, your heart. Come, Lord.